Welcome to the Getty Museum, uh, to both our in-person, very nice uh, in-person, and also the online audience. I think we have a pretty robust uh, online audience. My name is Davide Gasparotto. I am the senior curator of paintings here at the museum. Uh, I'm also the curator of the exhibition devoted to Giacomo Ceruti, uh, A Compassionate Eye, which in some way prompted the organization of this uh, afternoon, this conversation. Uh, but before we start, uh, I would like to acknowledge that the land Getty inhabits today was once known as Tovangar, the home of the Gabrieleño Tongva people. We show our respects to the Gabrieleño Tongva people as well as all first people, past, present, and future and honor their labor as original caretakers of this land. Getty commits to building relationship with the Gabrieleño Tongwa community, and we invite you to acknowledge the history of this land and join us in caring for it. I would love also to say a few words of sort of housekeeping rules, especially for our audience tuning in on Zoom. Uh, you, will, um, you will see that closed captioning has been enabled. To access live captioning, click the CC icon, uh, icon on the Zoom menu bar at the bottom of the screen. And also please use the Q&A function to ask questions. I can see your questions here on the iPad I have here on the table in front of me. And for in-person questions, instead, we'll have mics at the end uh, going on, and you can ask questions, um, because there will be some time for questions, I hope, at the end of our conversation. I'm joined today here by Tom Nichols, who is really our guest, the protagonist of this afternoon. Tom is a reader in history of art at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, so he came from uh, far away. Oh. This is not very well. And um, uh, Tom, uh, Tom's research interest encompass really the imagery of impoverished and outcast people in the early modern period and the intersection between art and identity in painting of the Venetian Renaissance. So, so he has also sort of two fields uh, that in some way are interconnected. Uh, one is Venetian painting of the 16th century. He wrote important books on Tintoretto, on Titian, and on Giorgione, so mo the most important painters of 16th century Venice. But he also uh, wrote a very important book, a book that was very important for me when I was uh, sort of working on this project on Ceruti. The book, uh, the title of the book is The Art of Poverty, Irony and Ideal in 16th Century Beggar Imagery, published in 2007, and later on in 2000, um, uh, later on he also edited another important book uh, um, with several other contributors, which uh, the title is Others and Outcasts in Early Modern Europe, Picturing the Social Margins. Both were really uh, very inspiring for me and very important for um, uh, when I was conceiving and thinking about the project on Ceruti. Uh, what we are talking about today is not really, we are not really focusing, I think, on Ceruti. We think to Ceruti more like of a point of arrival in some way of what we will be saying today, what we'll be talking about today. Um, but as a first question for Tom, because this is a question I, I ask him, in some way, why as <laughs> predominantly a scholar of Venetian 16th century painting, how did you become interested in images of social outsider? And are there images that really inspired and, uh, you and that prompted your uh, research and your interest in this type of images? Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Davide, and thank you for having me. Um, and thank you guys for coming along. Um, 
I suppose, yeah, I, I mean, starting off really studying Renaissance Venice, beautiful art, uh, full of mythology, full of beauty, uh, beautiful uh, Venus imagery. I don't know, maybe that kind of, uh, when I first encountered the Venetian tradition, I saw beauty, I saw color. Uh, uh, life, uh, but a high life too, a kind of life that was uh, a high cultural life. And I suppose maybe one thing slightly breeds an interest in me in the other. So to some extent, maybe I, I thought, well, what, what about the rest of the world? Is Renaissance art just about high culture, elite people? Um, you know, the limited purview, the limited version of the world that that gives you. Um, and that made me look into, want to look into the margins of paintings to some extent, literally looking into the kind of edges of paintings um, and finding these shadowy figures that kind of lurk there. Um, I, so, I, so I suppose that, that's kind of what first got me interested. Also, I have to just mention Tintoretto, Jacobo Tintoretto, who is a great painter of, to some extent, uh, non-elite people, um, not, not always, but they kind of lurk in his paintings in a way maybe that they don't in those of Titian or Veronese, for example. So I suppose but there, there was also in, something in your experience as a citizen of Glasgow, if I remember well, that yes. was important for um, you. Let me just follow that segue. Um, there's, my, there's the talk today. That's the name of uh, what we're doing, but let me just move forward. I just thought I'd put this slide in. Um, two photographs that, that are in the Getty collection and the, 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 the front page of a catalogue that was um, of an exhibition that was held here, I think, was it 2017? I can't quite read. Um, but this is, a, this is a Glasgow photographer, and I, I live and work in Glasgow, um, and um, Thomas Annan was one of the uh, very early photographers. Uh, these photos date from around um, 1869, 1870, so we're quite a long way back in the history of photography. And they show the glorious slums of the city, <laughs> in the centre of the city. Um, and, and, and Alan was, was commissioned by the, by the city authorities to go, and, um, to go and make these photographs as a record before they knocked these slums down. Um, they were very unseemly. They were right at the city, heart of the city. And so he was commissioned by the city authorities as part of their, as, as a kind of, for, for an archival reason. They wanted a kind of record of what had been there. Mm -hmm. um, and they just moved me hugely when I saw them. I found them deeply moving images because wandering into them, almost unobserved, are uh, the people who lived in the slums, uh, mostly Irish immigrants who came over from from Ireland to work in the fields. They're, they're peasants, I think, mm -hmm. and then moved into the city where they lived a terrible life. Um, so, I don't know, is it, it, I was thinking putting this in because in a sense, these, the, the, these, these, these images are here in your great collections at the Getty, mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of a great interest to me, also because they are kind of images of the poor in a new medium mm -hmm. that supposedly tells you the truth more than maybe a painting ever can. This is a denotative kind of medium, photography, mm. if you like. It gives you a... Yes. Uh, um, but, so that, but, yeah, but, but also condition. Not. Yeah, but they, not, they are not. <laughs> but maybe not, yeah. And um, when, when I was organizing the Thinking to the Ceruti, I thought a lot about um, these dichotomy between documentary and artistic in some way. And I thought a lot, it is, how should we look at these images? And I know that today we have a lot of, you know, contemporary photographers, a lot of artists engaged in sort of presenting images uh, of, you know, impoverished, unhoused, laborers, and, and the risk is always, in some way, to aestheticize uh, the dimension of poverty. And, uh, and so I think it's interesting to reflect also on this aspect, which, where is the boundary between documentary and, you know, making, um, you know, patronizing, you know, misrepresenting in some way. Yes, to what extent is the visual image of the poor 
now exhausted? You know, can we really make an image of poverty without patronising, uh, in some way, framing, uh, distancing the poor subject within the image? This is of great interest to me. Um, it was, of course, to Martha Rosler, who I'm just showing you uh, this slide uh, from the early 15, uh, sorry, 1970s, um, uh, in which she kind of is trying to highlight the impossibility of, uh, uh, of depicting the poor without patronizing and naming them negatively. So there's two different orders. There's the Bowery in New York, but you see the, 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 the kind of what may have been the poor there, but you don't see them. There's no figures in there. Instead, there's just... Um, these derogatory names that were floating around and mm -hmm. uh, kind of distancing and determining who, who you were seeing. Yeah. Um, so she's kind of saying this great long tradition of representing the poor is, is, is become almost impossible now. It's mm -hmm. finished, you mm -hmm. know, um, and that was 50 years ago. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's worth thinking about that, even uh, as we're talking today, that the mm -hmm. kind of limitations that David is pointing out yeah. the kind of way in which it's nearly always the non-poor looking at the poor, uh, and that's the case for even when we stand in a gallery and do the same thing, right? So yes, mm -hmm. but so going a little back now uh, to the early modern period, uh, um, can you talk a little bit about who is sort of typically shown in these images and? Here we'll see mostly images, I think, today from the 16th to the 17th centuries. Yeah, I mean, and once I started getting interested in these, these, these marginal types, I found that they were really very present, that they were easily, easily overlooked within Renaissance art with its grandeur and its beauty and its idealism, but they were kind of lurking there uh, and you could find them in very well-known paintings. Um, people of all sorts, uh, who are we really talking about? The word poverty is a difficult one to, to unpack. Um, but we're talking about people who are outsiders to that mainstream uh, white culture. Um, they may have different religious orientations or racial characteristics. Um, in these two paintings here, you, you kind of be easy, easily overlook their presence, uh, two very famous paintings by Titian and Velazquez. Um, but in both cases, we see uh, social minorities, people who are, um, who are potentially kind of outside of the, the mainstream. Um, the Titian on the left, we see uh, a Jewish-looking man approaching uh, Christ, and he's kind of contrasted with Christ. You can see that. Uh, he's accusing Christ, he's tormenting Christ. The interesting thing is by the early Titian, but it more or less, this painting is more or less contemporary with the opening of the first European ghetto in Venice in 1516, I believe. Mm. Um, and there again, the, the working maid there we see in Velazquez's marvelous painting, uh, one of my favorite paintings of all time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that painting on the right. Yeah. Um, Beautiful depiction mm -hmm. uh, of a uh, a working uh, a working woman. Mm. So um, lots of different types of people are getting represented, um, and you could become marginal for lots of different reasons. It might not be those things I've already mentioned. It might be that you have physical disability. You might be blind mm. or lame. Um, you might be uh, marginal uh, because you are kind of very low in the social hierarchy anyway. You're a porter or you're a a servant, um, you might suddenly become poor uh, or become marginal, having mm. been otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the phenomenon of the so-called shame-faced poor. Yeah, poor. Here we've just got some wanderers here, gy gypsies, so-called gypsies. I don't think we should be really using that word anymore because of the, we're thought to come from Egypt, but um, they start to be depicted uh, wandering about. Um, and we've got some people here too who are... Uh, maybe uh, dwarves, we do have some dwarves in the left here, um, or we have um, just a kind of capitano, uh, a, captain, a captain of the, the mm -hmm. baron, if you like, these kind of wandering beggars. Um, people who are, who are kind of put into images, why are they there? Is it comic? Uh, are we laughing at them? Um, or is there a, a kind of a, a level of fascination that's also interesting and we should explore as we... A level of fascination, but maybe of fear also. Yes, yes, mm. that's true. Yeah. Um, and then this was what you were talking about, the 
plunging from wealth to poverty? Well, I think it's, it's interesting just to be a bit more period specific a little bit. We're talking about the early modern. And what do we mean by that? Well, we don't quite mean the medieval anymore, because obviously this comes kind of after that point. And it doesn't yet mean the modern. So we're in a period of transition. Okay, I don't know when you want to put dates on it. Maybe it's something like the 14th century to the 18th century broadly, but I mean, you can't be, these are all constructs anyway. But it's a period of transition and change, okay? Early modern, it's between one thing and another. The world was changing very fast. It was opening up very fast, new horizons, the new world, etc., new knowledge. Uh, uh, it was a time of potential um, discovery, but also fear about what you were discovering. Uh, and it was a time of fluidity. So uh, I think the point of this slide really is to show you two images which show just how rapidly things could change for you. You know, you might be a, a rich man one day, but the next you might be a poor man. Uh, you might be a king, but you might also suddenly become a beggar. Um, or you might have once been born into a very, very rich aristocratic family and you'd think you'd be protected by that for the entirety of your life, but no. Uh, all over Europe, it's not just in, uh, this is an exa Italian example I'm showing you here, the so-called poveri vegognosi, mm -hmm. the shame-faced poor, who were begging around in the streets but covered their faces, in fact covered their entire bodies, um, so because they were so embarrassed, I think my thing's just fallen out. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was waiting for that. It was going to happen. I'm back on. Fix. That feels strange. Anyway, okay. Um, <clears throat> so these poverty begging, you'll see, wondering about uh, too 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 shamefaced um, to to beg. Um, mm -hmm. Always seen by the nun poor as very deserving, especially deserving of, of their mm -hmm. charity in their arms. Yes. And maybe if we so, we we should talk a little bit about uh, why these images of marginalized people, marginalized individuals, they start to sort of proliferate. They start to be more widespread in 16th century imagery, paintings, but prints a lot. So, yeah, so. I mean, I, I, I think we, we do need to think about that because that's one of the things I think I was trying to say was that I was surprised at how this imagery developed, how much of it there was once I started to look. <laughs> My book is full of these images. And why, why, why in the early modern period do, do, do people start to get to depict this, these phenomena? So surely they've always existed. And there's nothing really like it in the medieval period before. You do get some, some, some imagery, but nothing to the same extent. And partially you're looking at the phenomenon of the Renaissance in a way. I mean, I'm using that word again because, yes, of course, it means the rebirth of antiquity. But I think it also starts to become an aesthetic in the time that you should, um, you should imitate nature. The idea of um, imitatio, imitation, that mm. was Aristotle's idea originally, that art should depict what's there to some extent. Um, and what was there in early modern Europe was actually an awful lot of poor, impoverished and marginalized people. So they're going to get depicted just on the basis that this was now mm -hmm. what art thought it should do. Yeah. It's a very broad point. More narrowly, you've got expansion of the number of visual images, okay? There's just more visual imagery about being commissioned, bought, sold, partially on the back of things like the rise of the printing presses, so the rise of print culture. We're talking woodcuts, engravings, etchings, reproductive prints. Um, and so there's a, and, and partially because the genres of art are changing. Maybe it was more predominantly sacred art prior to this point, but during this period, many more secular images start to emerge and they're, they're being observed, seen in secular con contexts. Mm -hmm. And the rise, another thing I suppose, David, would be the rise of genre art yeah. is important to mention. Um, but in some way here, we are seeing two paintings by Jacopo Bassano, a 16th century Venetian painter who actually lived his entire life in this very small town in the mainland of Venice. Uh, so in a very, you know, rural in some way. Um, and we are seeing a painting which was 
no painting mm. for the private mm. market for mm. and then a painting which was church. an altarpiece mm. for a church mm. but what what do we see here well obviously paintings that are for private patrons maybe have a different kind of structure to those that are for the church and or for a devotional audience um i mean showing these two i suppose i'm dropping back a little bit to what i was saying before about the way that poverty could suddenly strike or um, the way that somebody who was quite comfortable um, within their social class, for example, whatever that might be, might suddenly be tipped into poverty by various events, disease, war, uh, crop failure, just being three of the most obvious. Um, and the painting on the left is a small painting in Washington, a marvelous painting by Bassano. Um, and it shows he was particularly loved to paint the rural land around where he, he lived and to paint the peasants tending animals in that land. Um, but, you know, the poverty is there. It's apparent enough. The foreground figures don't wear any shoes. There are ragged trousers, exposed knees, dirty, dirty flesh, if you like, sunburned flesh, uh, humble tasks. But it's kind of not shouting out at you, I'm poor, I am, I, I am in need of arms, I am in need of help. Um, it's a, what you might call a kind of structural poverty. That's to use a term that... Um, historians of the period often use. It's kind of based, it's there, but it's hidden in plain sight. Because let's face it, the, ma the majority of the population were probably fairly, pa uh, fairly poor. Whereas if you look on the, the image on the right, um, this is an image of crisis. It's made for a church in Vicenza in northern Italy at a time of plague. Uh, people have, have left the countryside. They've come to the town. I think it is a townscape. Uh, and they're lying around in the streets being helped uh, by various citizens of the town, um, including St. Rock, who's the great patron saint of the, of the, heart of the plague. Of the plague. Um, and so here you've got what you might call a crisis poverty rather than a structural poverty. Um, it's a moment of exceptional, of exceptional suffering. Um, so I suppose this, just the contrast between different types of poverty, uh, maybe in an urban, also in a rural um, mm -hmm. uh, location, which may lead us yeah. on. So, but I think images like these ones, but also other ones we are going to show, they sort of elicit another question. Who, we, we ask who is represented, but we have to ask, I think, also the other question, who looked at these images, why these images became in some way popular or they became widespread, were they given pleasure, why they... Why, why, they, why they gave pleasure. They <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's very important. I said earlier that I think, you know, normally speaking, you're not talking about the people who are being depicted looking so much at the image. So you're always looking at this kind of in a you know, kind of power relationship between the viewer and the impoverished subject, uh, in which the viewer is kind of maybe to some extent higher than the, the, uh, the, the, the depicted subject. Um, that's something to think about. Um, but if that's the case, now you can, you can get, you can go too far with this, but the next slide just shows us two examples of the way in which um, the poor were kind of, um, became almost an obsession with the, the high social elites. Uh, they're, they're really very strange, these images to me, but can you imagine having a, um, a beggar, a blind beggar with, with one leg built out of a pearl sitting in your room um, <laughs> to, to look down at you, look at, look to, for you to look down at and enjoy? Um, an incredible kind of confluence of, of riqueza, of material richness and an and impoverished subject. Or would you eat your dinner off a Mayalaka plate um, of, of, a, of a beggar? Um, the way in which they're kind of invited into, the way in which wealth and poverty, we've seen this before, kind of attract one another, interests me. And I'm thinking of a slightly kind of anthropological turn in my own thinking about this, which makes them apotropaic, uh, homeopathic, uh, I'm using those words, what I'm meaning is that they're kind of like attracts, mm. or, or you bring something near to you to protect yourself from it, 
You know, you bring the thing that you fear into your home. <laughs> the thing that you fear most, there it is, right in front of you. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's a kind of interesting, um, you know, with these, with these kind of very elite objects, um, you know, whether or not that Maiolica plate was actually used to have your dinner. <laughs> Possibly it wasn't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, certainly we know from, 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 from say, Peter Bruegel as well, just how close the peasants came uh, into the hall and kind of performed themselves in, in, in contemporary Brussels mm -hmm. and Antwerp at the same time. So this is quite a, a European phenomenon. I think that might explain the pleasure the, 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 and the, the interest, at least in these kind of elite objects. But yeah. also, in some way, it tells that, <clears throat> I think, uh, in contrast with maybe a 19th century artist, uh, you know, and where there is a, or, a, or a contemporary artist, maybe, where there is a strong component of, you know, social critique, uh, attack mm. the... the you know, That's social, nice political fabric in some way. Here, we don't see this phenomenon. We, I don't, think that takes we don't have an engaged yeah. artist sure. in, in denouncing the... I think that takes us back to the sense of periodicity or the period that we're looking at. And I'd say in very broad terms that we can't look at... We tend to look at them through the prism of, of an informed, say, French realism, through Millet, Courbet. 1850 France, and we, we see a kind of political agenda of painters that were potentially painting to point out a social problem and to uh, and to want uh, and with a kind of a subtext of, of change. Um, I don't think we find that so much before that period. So in this period, we're not looking at works that that are about that are about um, social change. Mm -hmm. I think, in, for the most part, the status quo is kind of accepted by the object. Now, we have to get past that. That might kind of disappoint us um, from our perspective, but we have to still get past that to these extraordinary works and to admit that they could still, without that, they could still express um, a, a fantastic uh, range of emotions. I'm going to move on away from those. <laughs> <laughs> you see, <laughs> curious yeah. to... When I saw this image in your slides, I was uh, like... Uh, Excited? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I never thought about this image, thinking about uh, a, a, like a beggar. And, um, but I, I thought a lot about environments when I was working on the Cheruti show, because sometimes you have people uh, with, who are clearly in a... like. R rural environment, mm. people is instead depicted in an urban. So I think these di these di dichotomy in some way, rural and city, city and, mm. and countryside is some way important for this early depiction of... Yes, I mean, I people. think we've seen it before in those Bassano slides. To certain Sano slide to a certain extent, and I think we see it again here. It just it's it's so extraordinary that in this Renaissance image of a from the late 15th century in Italy um, of an ideal city with perfected classical buildings and wonderful marble symmetry and perfection, we have this person creeping across the front. Um, and what what what's he doing there? Why why, why depict? This, this impoverished um, man, you know? <laughs> Is the artist saying to you that the city inevitably breeds poverty? Is it a kind of relationship again the, of, of attraction almost, the, the ideal city? Is he saying something more? Is he saying the Christian city of the Renaissance is, is, is an improvement on the classical city, uh, the pagan city, uh, because we have the poor, and because through the poor, we're able to give charity to God and to redeem our souls. And so it has a moral, um, you, whilst you refer back to the classical world, you also, by his presence, uh, indicate the superiority of the present. Now, I'm not saying that I know that that's, the, that's, that's why he's there. Um, maybe it's just by way of contrast. Maybe you have to, with all that perfection and beauty and achieved culture, you have to have something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that isn't, uh, mm -hmm. that's, more, that's more real. I, um, but there's various ideas I'm flinging out there, but it, it does, 
relate to a very old idea that I think that the city poor were a badge of the city. They're like a marker of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a marker of the city's beneficence, its charitable nature, and that it will supply. Um, we can imagine mm -hmm. that though he's poor, he will receive succor in the city. And they're often shown actually near city gates or entrances or near the gate of a church. Uh, they're still uh, people mm -hmm. still will sometimes congregate yeah. in those, those portals, mm -hmm. those liminal spaces of the city. Mm -hmm. And then we have the... <laughs> and then <laughs> we're going to the rural. Um, so then we have images that do something different. Um, and when they, these beggar families, which is what I think they are, these vagrant families are shown, they start to be, they begin to be shown, mostly in prints, and we're going to northern prints here. They're, they're not in the city, they're wandering, they're in, mm -hmm. they're in movement. They're not the settled city poor. They're not the deserving poor. And there was a kind of age-old distinction, goes back to the church fathers, between the honest poor mm -hmm. and the dishonest poor, okay? Mm -hmm. You should always only give charity to the honest poor. And then there was a whole set of people who were dishonest, okay? They were undeserving of charity. Mm -hmm. If you gave charity to them, you'd be giving to the devil, okay? You wouldn't be saving your soul. So, <laughs> if, if I remember well, there is one of the first editions, printed editions of the Liber Vagatorum that has a preface by Martin Luther, and he is very harsh against these dishonest poor, the he poor is, who he are writes, posing as a poor, yes. but they are not poor, they are scoundrels. I mean, this, this Liber Vagatorum was, was the, the book of vagrants of the beggar order. It, it was uh, really quite a pernicious book, if I might say so. I mean, it's published, went through lots of different editions. There's an English edition of the 1860s. It was translated into <laughs> English. Um, so it was still kind of thought to be, and it's literally a list of 28 types, of, or 29 maybe, types of deceiving beggars. Things to watch out for as you walk down the street. These are the different tricks they're liable to play on you. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be tying up a leg that's basically healthy and pretending to be disabled. They might be rolling around in the dirt, pretending they got the falling sickness. Um, they might be pretending to be a family, um, traveling along, um, deserving with loads of children. But you know what, they might have stolen those mm -hmm. children. They're not, they're not their real children. Um, and of course, these kind of things will be resonating with you today, won't they? <laughs> uh, they still resonate with me. But um, you know, these kind of doubts about uh, the, the validity mm. of, the, of, of poverty, mm -hmm. um, of the faith and of poverty. In some way, the beggar, the begging poor, really becomes the great protagonist of many 17th century, 16th, 17th century works of art, paintings, important paintings. And uh, in, in your book, in some way, you, you try to um, talk about sort of these two different visions of the begging poor. Uh, the one that makes him, you know, a worth of charity, mm. the a sort of a new Christ coming on earth, so worth of respect, charity, and so as a positive, mm. you know, figure. And on the other side, as a negative, you... These two ways that you, yeah, I mean, we're you working, defined as ironic and ideal. I suppose we're working broadly within a, a Christian tradition which has been doing that for a very long time. Um, and I think it starts to get making that dichotomy. Um, and because of the concern around charity and, and, and the kind of idea that the poor can be both a, a traditionally could be a, a badge of Christ, could be, a, could be a, a sac almost seen as a sacred uh, thing, um, and at the same time, I'm, I'm, spot, I'm pointing out a new level, a new measure of distrust. Um, and I think the important thing here, my book was called Irony and Ideal, mm -hmm. was to make the point that these two different traditions were kind of closely interlinked with one another. They, they seem like they're the opposite kind of thing, but actually they're the same thing, in my view. This was my argument. Um, but that's maybe something we can come back to. What I mean by that, I suppose, is that if on the one hand you're vilifying um, 
at needy people, you might be praising them, uh, others, and it's part of the same kind of ideological mm -hmm. conception mm -hmm. that you could you could judge you you will, your judgment will come in to make a choice between which are deserving and which aren't. Um, here's just a, a famous image by of Hieronymus Bosch, uh, who who depicted some marvelously fiendish. Um, fiendish, impoverished people. Um, this will maybe come back to you very briefly towards the end of this talk, just might be a self-portrait, but putting that aside for now, he's an idle beggar. It's on the outside, outside of an altarpiece. Uh, idle peddler who is wandering along the, the road of life uh, towards a cracked bridge. He's looking down at some bones picked over by a black bird. Above him, directly above him, are some gallows. To the right, there's some lustful dancing. To the left, there's a, there's a robbery taking place. He's living in a world of sin, and he's, his impoverishment is a sign of his depravity, really. And the, the depravity of the world, a world that's just full of, of devilishness. Mm -hmm. um, so you have that, uh, and then you also have these images. Uh, from the same period, okay, I've gone from the north to the south, and these are all these are uh, made, uh, images made in Italy. But you have um, impoverished pe uh, people in the two lower works there by Peruzzi and Poussin, who are modelled seemingly on Michelangelo's Adam, um, and the beautiful proportions of Michel Michelangelo's Adam kind of come through for you. Mm -hmm. They're undressed, they lie on so the, the idea of nudity. Of nudity, yeah. al antica, uh, mm -hmm. like the antique, a kind of um, quality of nakedness and beauty, uh, expressing their kind of, I think, their kind of justification, their, their positive position mm -hmm. uh, within the, the, the order depicted. And you have also other examples. Another example moving to... We go to Tintoretto, Tintoretto here. <laughs> yes, my love, but much loved Tintoretto, who played a lot of attention to the people in the margins of his paintings. This is St. Rock again. We saw him before. The, he and the, 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 the plague, uh, plague, um, plague saint. And these, these very, very complexly arranged margins to the picture with an empty hole in the middle. Um, but the, look at the bodies of the, the plague stricken in this hospital. They, they're, 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 they're shaped and modeled according to a whole range of classical sculptures, actually, not just Michelangelo. And in a certain way, beautified by, by that link. You know, um, the kind of the, the way in which the viewer is to perceive them. Mm -hmm. And I think this originally hung in a hospital yeah. for um, plague stricken but, people. But I think that one of your <laughs> arguments is that we usually associate the so called sanctus pauper, the the sacred poor, the sacred poor yeah. more with the south of South Europe, Spain, Italy, yeah. the Catholic, more Catholic countries where obviously charitable activities were part of the duty yeah. of the wealthy. Uh, but you, your argument is that we find also positive attitude toward the poor in northern European. Yeah, so I'm showing you, a, uh, this is a a print, little, little print, one of a, a set of prints showing the seven acts of mercy where Christ, uh, kind of in Matthew, almost identifies himself with the poor. Are you were the one. Um, I was the one, sorry, to whom you gave alms in life, he says to the saved at the last judgment. So he was kind of acting as the poor, right? Um, and this man, Pence, is a follower of Dura. Uh, he's not a particularly important artist, but he, interestingly, these prints were made in Nuremberg in the 1530s, which was a newly Protestant city. It had become Protestant. Uh, Dura himself became Protestant, of course, in later life. Mm -hmm. and, and so was Pence. And so were his patrons. So it would be tempting to kind of do a Weberian, a kind of an idea that somehow the Protestant Reformation is the reason behind um, the rise of the false beggar. Um, mm -hmm. Except Bosch's paintings were pre, they, they were pre-Luther, right? Mm -hmm. um, Luther may have been involved with the Liber Bacatorum, but mm -hmm. in Protestant images like this one, you still see Christ as the, as an, in an idealized form, as a, uh, uh, you know, a rather classicized figure whose yeah. who's physical beauty. Yeah. So there's a, it's, it's not as simple as, as, yeah. as it, you know, can't really kind of describe these images in terms of these two, mm -hmm. um, of the schism within Christianity. Uh, it, it doesn't really yeah. work when you look yeah. closely. But 
to me is certain that there is there is a big change between in some way, I don't know if you agree with this, between the 16th and the 17th century, because I think in some way the realistic attitude of artists in the 17th century is sort of a game changer in the depiction of the marginals, the mar marginalized individuals, the poor, and I don't know if you agree, but both I think in North, Northern and Southern Europe, the 17th century adds a new, very important dimension to the depiction of the poor. I think you're right. I mean, if I've been looking at this right, um, then I think the, <clears throat> the 16th century is very much about moralizing traditions, either for or against the poor, whereas the 17th century becomes more playful, um, more kind of artificial in a way, more knowing, more theatrical, Mm -hmm. And it plays across these older traditions, and it does so with great sophistication. Um, and maybe not all the images can be quite ascribed to these two parallel traditions I was mentioning. Um, and when you look at a great artist like Rembrandt, and I, I couldn't resist these two uh, fantastic etchings by Rembrandt, you, it's more difficult to find, um, you know, a kind of a consistent position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the poor that Rembrandt is taking. Uh, he's clearly very, very interested in them. I mean, they, you only have to look through the corpus of his etchings, well, many of his paintings too, and his drawings, to know just how interested he is in the, in, the, in the phenomenon of poverty and impoverished people. But when you look more closely, they are, um, there are lots of different variations in the way he shows them. Only the slightest kind of variation can, can, can generate different meanings. So I think, say, on the image on your left here, mm -hmm. you've got a rat catcher. Now, I wouldn't want to meet that guy too readily at my door, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And you can see the reaction of the, <laughs> the potential man who's confronted. And this guy is, if, unless, you, unless you kind of do something for him. If you let you invite him into your home to get rid of your rats, he's going to put some rats there. You know, he's, he's brought the rats with him. <laughs> There's a few of them <laughs> definitely alive. And he towers over the figure. Um, so arms giving at the door, it's interesting. Uh, it's, would it be quite that? I don't know. A rat catcher is, mm -hmm. a, is a lower class person. And then on the right, again, the scene at the door. But you may be more, um, you might be more... Um, What's the word? More sympathetic to that family crowded round there who look like they're in need with children. He's a blind hurdy-gurdy player, actually. You can just about glimpse the, the hurdy-gurdy. But he's with his wife and children, and he's, it looks like a family, and it looks like some arms are going to be given, and that will reconfirm this as a kind of uh, an act, if you like, of, of charity mm -hmm. in the normal lines. But I'm interested in just how slight the variations are um, between the two images to make this kind of difference in the, and the viewer is being said, the viewer is being asked in a different way. He's being addressed more individualistically. Mm -hmm. Note that yeah. these are kind of private citizens who people are knocking on their, <laughs> their, home, their doors of their homes. This isn't taking place in a church, it's taking place uh, out in the city. And it's a private decision that will have to be made every time. This rat catcher or that deserving or, the, or that hurdy-gurdy player, mm -hmm. you know, which will it, what will I do in any mm -hmm. one? The private conscience. Who, who do you think would have, could have been the audience for this kind of prints? Well, I think we're talking about, surely talking about people in Amsterdam primarily, um, reformed a Protestant culture, Calvinistic culture in which, but a more private culture, and in a way a very modern kind of culture, which, which puts the emphasis more on individual decisions perhaps than, mm -hmm. than on institutional um, mm -hmm. observances. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that it would all, these would also be reproductive prints. Mm -hmm. There's more than what, you know, they're, they're relatively cheap. You can buy them, but I mean, I'm, you know, Rembrandt was making yeah. a living from them, but yeah. 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 And then, I think we have, in the 17th century, artists um, like Georges de la Tour, Murillo, the Lenin brothers, young Velázquez that we have seen, which seem in some way very invested in giving us a very um, empathetic, in some way, image of 
impoverished individuals or people living on the street. Um, I think with different degrees no, of mm. empathy or, or realistic okay. attitude or idealization. I think these two images are very, very, very interesting to compare in some way, you know? Yes. I, I mean, don't know I, what you think, but... I think, uh, again, I think it's, it, it, this is a very interesting fact, because you might be thinking, well, what about the question of style? You know, how does naturalism come into all this? Mm -hmm. um, is something more natural, natural looking? Could it still contain ideas? Uh, or is it more just kind of what you see inductively, what you bring in from outside? You know, mm. imitation of nature, mentioning that again. Um, I mean, it's, I could have shown another painting by George de la Tour here, but I, I chose this um, blind hurdy gurdy player. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 you know, you will, if you've been to the Chiriti exhibition of it well, you'll know um, that in a way, this kind of approach to almost like a portraiture of the a poor, a, a single man whose head is high in the space, observed in strong light, um, with great detail to surfaces mm -hmm. and um, to all the details of his appearance, um, uh, as he's, he's singing, I think, uh, maybe he's just kind of croaking, mm -hmm. but he, you know, he's, 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 he is, he's, he's inwardly concerned with his music. Is the artist laughing at him? Are we meant to laugh at him? Are we meant to find him ugly? Uh, or does it do something else? Mm -hmm. does, it, does, it, does it enter, you know, open up yeah. a kind of intimate relationship with I, him? I think for me, George, like a painting like the Georges de la Tour, is really, the, to me, the forerunner of what we see in Ceruti, so this kind of portrait-like, depiction focus one single figure, very monumental, individualized. Um, it, we are seeing really here not a type, but mm. you know, a human being in some way. And but so that, yes. th there, is, there is this strong connection. So, uh, and, but some, some, in some other occasions, Georges de Latour, like for example, in the painting that we have here at the Getty, it looks like more like a moralizing picture, more a little bit satirical. Mm. So I think even within the corpus of the same artist, we have, well, that's, uh, yeah. there are differences. That's, I mean, I, I could well have shown that. In fact, I did think about showing the, the you know, the two, you, you maybe noticed it in the gallery, the, mm -hmm. the, the man squirting lemon juice into a, into a blind man's face. <laughs> They're having a fight and, um, uh, he's being exposed as a false beggar because he's only pretending to be blind. We're back to the liver vagatorum. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, the, the other beggar is squirting uh, lemon juice into his eyes to say, no, look, it's hurting you. you, you you've got sensitivity, you can see. Uh, and, you know, that's, it, the whole thing's quite comedic, it's mm -hmm. quite funny. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and it's a bit like the point I made with Rembrandt. Within a few years, or maybe even in the same period, George de la Tour can paint this this other um, this portrait here we have of the, the hurdy gurdy mm -hmm. man, who is um, who is he was treated with a different kind of more respect, a different tone. It's not quite just comedic comic satire. It's mm -hmm. there's a more uh, is it sympathy? Well, it's it's certainly maybe empathy is a better word. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, something about the humanity of this man sitting there uh, on the outside, and um, we maybe many of us have been there. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you but the contrast, you know, you can't make that typical of the period. There's lots of different approaches mm -hmm. going on, and, and yeah, the yeah, contrast and with Murillo is is, is striking. Is striking. Yeah. Murillo, who we know was personally involved in Sevilla with charitable activities, he was really, you know, part of a confraternity, mm. but his depictions of these mm. child, children living in the street looks very, to me at least, you know, very staged, very idealized, they have a lot of food, uh, so I, I don't know how do you... Well, it's extraordinary you amounts this? of food in these paintings, <laughs> which is the one thing that the poor possibly didn't have. 
Um, but maybe they are the gifts, you see, of the, of, the, of the patrons who have kind of put those beautiful still life, well, they've put those fruit in front of them and they're feeding them. Mm -hmm. And the boys are, ex ex except the boys are still playing dice, right? It's dice, it's a, it's a dicey game. It's, it's a game of fortune. They've still got dirty feet. They're still there. But as, as David is saying, um, perhaps they are, there, there, there is a kind of softening of the light, that kind of um, mm -hmm. delicacy of brushwork, a uh, very Italianate brushwork, uh, which is unlike, for example, Velazquez, who came before him, or mm -hmm. Zerberan, people like this, Rubén. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of these paintings, at least, these, these child paintings, Vegas, were for English patrons or for foreign patrons. So they were kind of made, we need to think about who's looking at these paintings at all points, yeah. and they were made for a very remote mm -hmm. and distant audience. Mm -hmm. Um, to hang on their very wealthy walls mm -hmm. uh, and to um, to calm their nerves about the reality of social injustice mm -hmm. in their period. I think you put together a last series of slides, which I really appreciated uh, because um, I was rather puzzled always by the self-portrait of Ceruti, which is in the exhibition, uh, where he depicts himself as a sort of a humble man, as a pilgrim on a religious journey, no brushes, no palette, no frills, no nice dress. And, and you, you have an argument here about artists portraying themselves as humble, as mm. dispossessed. Almost. Well, again, I think it's more of a... Well, it, you, you can find examples in the 16th century, even earlier, in fact. Um, but the examples I've given you here in the 17th century, it's the early bohemian artist, isn't it? It's the kind of proto-bohemian, the artist who identifies himself with his outcast subjects, mm -hmm. uh, his marginal subjects. Um, why does he do that? Um, well... It could be half jokey, um, mm -hmm. nearly Rembrandt self-portrait stuck on a beggar's head that you see there. Um, could it also have much older causes? The idea of the humours, the four humours, the artists are melancholic, they're born under the sign of Saturn, mm -hmm. they have a propensity to wonder. Um, and this was an age-old tradition, we can find it in early prints, uh, what artists are included alongside uh, prisoners or plowmen or mm. uh, outcast people wandering. Um, and so there's something about that kind of astrological background that, that plays in. Um, the two other images here, wonderful images, of uh, self-portraits of artists um, with their mouths wide open and um, kind of responding in exaggerated manner, mm -hmm. <laughs> theatrical manner, to being kind of, well, in the middle, I think, from the marvellous Adrian Brown, one of my favourite artists, um, it, with his mouth wide open. He's been discovered down the pub with four of, um, three or four of his artist friends, um, which is all very shocking because artists were, at this point, artists like Nicholas Poussin, and, mm -hmm. uh, were, were very busy trying to turn themselves into gentlemen. Um, we think of Rubens. Uh, they owned estates. They, had, they owned their own um, impoverished people. They had their own peasants. Uh, here he is cocking a snoop at that, um, that whole idea of the identity of the artist as a gentleman as a man who, who kind of moves with the ruling mm -hmm. classes. Yes. Um, instead, he depicts himself as a rough toper. He's just had a, a, a smoke of tobacco. He's no doubt very drunk, but he's, you know, tobacco also was seen as a hallucinogen at the time. So you could, you could see that he's probably off, what well, you might say is off his face. He's, he's very, <laughs> but there he is. Um, as for Peter Van, Van Leer there, an extraordinary, painting of him discovering devilish things as he necromances. Um, but this man is extremely interesting as the leader of a bunch of Dutch artists in Rome, I believe, mm -hmm. known as the Bamboccianti. Depicting um, the street scenes. He, he was himself physically um, disabled, I think, in some kind of way. Um, but he kind of bigged up this and uh, had followers in Rome and depicted these depiction, these little de these, these street scenes of beggars clambering over the ruins of mm -hmm. Rome in the yeah. 1640s. Yeah. Again, in a way, cocking a snoop, if you can use that word, um, 
um, phrase um, against this idea of the artist as, a, as an elite figure. So identifying in a kind of proto way, in a way that must remind us of some of the post-romantic, um, you know, re-identifications mm -hmm. of the artist uh, as against the establishment mm -hmm. uh, that we're very familiar with. But these are earlier examples of that, I think. And there are also some other, again, the Bosch and and the reverse of the medal with the portrait of Michelangelo. So kind of yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I mentioned before that maybe this Bosch um, peddler is a self-portrait. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of think it is, given a few other things. Um, so he kind of identifies with, the, with this um, sinful peddler walking along uh, on, uh, towards the crack bridge, uh, you know, chock full of sin and depravity himself. And he does so because... Um, uh, he, he wouldn't have exempted himself, in a sense, from his more general sense of the world is sin-filled. But artists could turn that round, and um, this medal made by a follower of Michelangelo right at the end of Michelangelo's life. Michelangelo, the most famous and revered artist of his time, of course. Um, but showing himself, again, as a kind of impoverished pilgrim, with a pilgrim's hat, staff, and dog, and a water flask walking along the road of life, the rocky road of life. Uh, pilgrims were exalted in a certain way mm -hmm. and, and had given up um, the blandishments of the world, uh, given up worldliness and were concentrated uh, solely on God. Uh, this is an, a medal from late in Michelangelo's life as he approached his own death. And so, in a way, the great artist, the great one of the greatest artists of the of the, of the epoch, is is again identifying himself as, as an outcast. As a, yeah. And I, I put the charity in as, a, as just a thought because yeah, he yeah. is holding what looks like a pilgrim staff. A pilgrim staff, oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yes. Maybe. Um, I think we we may have a last uh, image, which maybe you can <laughs> try a little bit to sum up which are sort of these, some of the yeah, defining the features of the depiction of the, the poor, the marginalized in early modern people, and also contrast with the, like more modern, more like 20th century. Well, it, it's, where, where yes. Are there similarities, are there differences? So just to recap, I suppose I think that I, you know, there's an expansion in the imagery of the social margins in the period, and I've just shown a very, very small number of images. There's a sense in which originally this relates to the expansion of imagery more per se through society. It might at certain points reflect religious change, but ultimately it reflects that, that, that kind of desire to imitate nature uh, that was part of this, this period's aesthetic. Um, I think originally we may be seeing two traditions, an ironic tradition that emerges very strongly in the early mm -hmm. 16th century, uh, related to some extent to the Protestant Reformation, but not entirely determined by it and soon spreading much wider. And against that, we have a traditional kind of restatement of the idea of sacred poverty. We've just seen that. So we've got these ir ironic and ideal traditions. But I think by the time you get to the 17th century, as we've just been saying, these, it, it becomes less clear-cut. Mm -hmm. the, the, the traditions become less didactic. And to some extent, we're, 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 it, 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 uh, the imagery becomes more self-reflexive. Artists are identifying with their subjects and through very slight changes are able to register different meanings, uh, complex meanings in their works. And I suppose my final slide here, which is showing um, a Walker Evans photograph <laughs> um, against a, a painting from the 17th century, is really just to, to, to end by thinking about the question of the relation of any of these images to the real, to reality, whatever that is, right? Um, how far are even the most documentary photographs? Um, I said earlier that, and it's been said before by Linda Nocklin, amongst others, that the 19th century imagery of, of poverty is based on an idea of misery, her book, Misere, I'm talking about, mm -hmm. uh, based on a, a documentary approach, uh, sociological implications, with an implication that you're documenting a social reality uh, and that you're not constructing the image in any way. Mm -hmm. The image is just a transparent, you know, has a transparent relationship to the real. And you might take the Walker Evans photograph as a, you know, for the farm administration as, as an example of that, but we now know that they, these were also quite 
quite, quite staged and um, that he was instructed to make the poverty look worse than it was, mm. um, <laughs> um, which is interesting when you think about it, how different are these two, two images? I'm, I'm struck by their, their, their similarity. Um, the Lalanne painting is a marvelous picture to my mind in St. Petersburg of, of, a, of, 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 a, of a peasant family. Um, and uh, they stood there uh, in, uh, with some fantastic images of children uh, playing pipes. They're, I think they're all listening to, to the music. And there's that wonderful shadowy boy at the entrance to the right there, the back entrance, mm -hmm. uh, who seems to be excluded from the group. And there's a kind of matriarchy mm -hmm. at the left, which I, I just love. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, it's, 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 you know, this is a very, very constructed image, although it looks naturalistic Natural. it, yeah. you know yeah. and i would and when we go and you know think about chiruti again yeah. the images look very very real mm -hmm. but are they that was my final yeah question. yes thank you very much tom okay um i think we can open up for maybe some questions and perhaps uh, uh i can start with the there are a couple of interesting questions here from our online audience which you may answer one is uh, the question, did the artists actually have stage models in a studio or did they sketch them secretly in the streets? Uh, I don't know if you would like to answer to this uh, uh, question. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think of, that makes me think of the anecdote of Peter Bruegel, the elder, the great peasant Bruegel, used to be known, um, going out in disguise to the villages to, to, to depict peasants. He had to, he kind of dressed up as a peasant so that they wouldn't notice. Um, I think for the most part, we're talking about, we don't, we're not talking about going out into the streets. And I mm -hmm. think nearly all of these images are made um, away from the immediate models in reality. But wh what about that George de la Tour? That's, that does interest me. Yeah. And also some of the paintings by the Lenan, which we, we've just been looking at, I do wonder whether there weren't sittings mm -hmm. sometimes. So the answer is, <laughs> you know, probably a range of approaches, but for the most part, we are talking about, you know, inventions, mm -hmm. even if they went out into the street to depict the poor. Um, and make notes, they mm -hmm. would come back to make their wor artworks, which mm -hmm. they would work up uh, and and um, consider their particular context, mm -hmm. their audiences, so they would be... I, I thought a lot when I was preparing Ceruti about this relationship between uh, truth to life uh, yes. and uh, tradition, yes. convention, sure. which I think is very always very important, always something that we have to take to take into yes. account when we are talking about early modern art. So Absolutely. tradition, yeah. iconographic traditions and conventions are as important as uh, Many uh, truth to life as depiction from life. At a particular some. context. So there is always a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe questions from the audience here? Hello. Yes. Well, my, my we wait for the microphone. question is who buys these paintings if you want to <laughs> hang that walker evans in your dining room <laughs> <laughs> you know, who's the audience well i mean it, they they vary very very widely um i would say that most of the audiences are fairly distanced from the people mm -hmm. that are depicted uh, you know the context in which they're looked at um is going uh -huh. to be fairly distant yeah. from the, the situation of the people who you are looking at. I think yeah. I was trying to say that at the beginning, that we're always looking to some extent from mm -hmm. a distanced perspective. Mm -hmm. I know that the Martha Rossler uh, uh, photo photography was trying to make that point. She said, don't go on depicting these people. Mm -hmm. That's finished. Yeah. You know, Whenever you do that, all you're doing is mm -hmm. reconfirming mm -hmm. their poverty. Yeah. And, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whether she's right or not, I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. um, that was certainly very yeah. polemical because she was, she was reacting to the Bowery mm -hmm. uh, for photographs yeah. uh, and in I, New York. I can tell you something. Um, in the 17th century, a painter, Salvatore Rosa, wrote a satire about painting. And in this satire, he attacks uh, patrons, collectors, mm -hmm. who were collecting 
um, paintings with depiction of you know poor impoverished people people living on the street people and he attacks the collector and say why are you hanging in your homes with uh, paintings with rich beautiful gilded frames and with these depictions and he was attacking these people saying that they're they for their hypocrisy basically but evidently there was a demand mm. in the 17th century. Well, it goes back to this for these kind of yeah. It goes back to this idea that somehow people like looking at mm. people who are much better off, much worse off than they are. Um, they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. There is another interesting question we may want to answer here online from Tara White. I was wondering if there is any correlation between the depiction of the dishonest poor and cultural otherness. For example, she asks, are people from other geographical areas or people with darker skin tone shown more as the dishonest beggars, uh, which writers and artists yeah. warned about? I, I don't think so, but maybe. I, mm. Well, I think it's a very interesting question, that. Mm. And I think there's quite a lot of overlaps, mm. formal overlaps, okay? Not only just med media, but also formal overlaps and also uh, between mm -hmm. different types um, of people who are shown. Um, so, for example, peasants, beggars are often shown as very similar. It's hard to work out whether that's a peasant or that's a beggar. Um, uh, sometimes you will see Jewish people with beggars. Uh, you'll see a wandering Jew, for example. So it's a cliche of the period um, from the various texts. Mm -hmm. And they look just like the vagrant beggars. Yeah. Um, so actually, the imagery does... Um, kind of um, extend beyond, beyond any one um, type of impoverished or outcast person. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can see a lot of connections between the different ways mm -hmm. in which they're shown. Um, actually, uh, uh, an author called Diane Wolftal wrote a very good book recently on um, depictions of servants, and mostly female servants in the early modern period, um, which had a really interesting gender dimension. We didn't talk about gender today, but there's an interesting mm -hmm. aspect to that. And she noticed that servants, depictions of servants, mm -hmm. not just the early modern period, not just the West, but nearly all over the world, seem to take up a similar position within the frame of an image, mm -hmm. towards its margins, towards its edge, whilst, the, whilst the, 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 the person who is being served is central. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you'll find it reversed, but most of the time that's a kind of convention that's almost super cultural. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. there's interesting, interesting things there. Another question from the audience. Um, were there, uh, was there a p proliferation of artists who engaged in painting poverty um, because they didn't have a patron or they weren't interested in religious paintings or it was less expensive to get uh, what you needed to do painting? I just wonder if that factors in at all? Well, I, I believe it does. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, even with Chiruti, it would be interesting to know more, but I, I feel that mm -hmm. some painters became renowned for this kind of work, and so in a way it becomes part of a marketing strategy for their work. Mm -hmm. uh, they become kind of associated with their subject matter that way, not only in the astrological ways, but literally in terms of works they've already done. So if they do one which is successful, then particularly in print culture, they'll make another. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of does link into the rise of market forces and capitalist forces in this period, mm -hmm. um, you know, away from the feudalism of the previous period. Um, and that might be another reason why they become so popular. Once you have one, somebody else wants another one. So I think you're right, and I'm right, I'm right. I think Charity's nickname... It was Il Pitocchetto, so the little beggar, so Pitocchetto. he became known for this, so because yeah. of his depictions of marginalized so that I were particularly appreciated and famous. Having said that, you know, Rembrandt, when he was painting, or oh, sorry, etching, many of his beggar images, the very same period, 1630s and 40s, he was also a great society portraitist. So he would be working for different audiences, perhaps at the same mm -hmm. time, and doing different types of work 
uh, at the same same time. At the same time, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I should mention that Tom and I will be in the gallery where the Ceruti exhibition is in the East Pavilion, Gallery is 201, for some time. So ready to ask to answer to any other question, curiosities you may have, or just to discuss these incredible pictures that is if really, you an, come along, please really an opportunity yeah. to have them here in Los Angeles because we don't have anything like that in the museum and so the, their presence in some way announces in a very special way our collection. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.